All set? Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Pastor Dan, did you remember to hit your record button? I did. Okay. It is recording. Um, would you like to help me, Cheryl, with the um, call to worship? Sure. Since you are unmuted at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is the refuge for us. Amen. Let us hear our first song today from Jeff, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin a double cure save from wrath and make me pure thank you jeff let us pray and you will lead us in our, our prayer bill our congregational prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, you call us to believe in you, to believe the good news of your coming into our lives. It matters not where we are when you call or what we have done. Your love is greater than our sins. There is nothing hidden from you, O oh Lord, and thereby nothing that will come between us that cannot be overcome. Your disciples followed immediately, leaving what they knew for something they saw as greater. Let your love touch us as it did them, and let you call your call to ministry overwhelm us so we have no choice but to respond. Help us, O oh Lord, to believe in ourselves as we you believe in us. In your precious name of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. 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 So as we continue in prayer, I will ask, as I always do, if there are others that uh, we need to add to our prayer list this morning.
Prayers of Thanksgiving. Lori's getting her uh, vaccination on Wednesday. A friend of mine's what? sister died from COVID last week. Not quite 58 years old. <clears throat> Wickham House might be losing two more residents because of COVID. Oh, a prayer of thanks that Jim Landry is feeling very good and up and about and so far both um, of his children and his wife are doing okay after COVID. Praise God. Nice to have uh, praise reports. <clears throat> An update, my sister tested negative for COVID and she's doing better. And right. our friend Claudio has been moved from ICU into a regular floor. So he's still in the hospital, but progressing. All right. We need to keep <clears throat> Janet in our prayers too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> <clears throat> My niece out in Indiana has to have an operation to have a kidney removed. So, that's prayers for her. And what was her name, Bill? Janelle. <clears throat> I think I do have some good news to share as well that the um, Van Seth family that we've been praying for with COVID are all recovered or at least in the final phase of recovery. So Praise God. Um, Kathy's asked that they be removed from our list. <clears throat> Praise God. Yes. have a friend in Florida who has literally been in her house for 11 months to avoid COVID and she finally got her two shots and went out to dinner for the first time in 11 months yesterday. Wow. Oh, excellent. So now she has freedom again. Wow that is a celebration indeed. So for those of you that missed the diagnosis or the, the um, injury that Janet's facing today, um, she's been having a, uh, an issue with her neck that she's in a lot of pain and can't move very much. And with her arm, her forearm, that she's having also a lot of pain and some tingling in her fingers so it seems to be affecting her circulation so just for those things we'd like to lift her up so if there are no more uh, let us continue on in prayer heavenly father we do thank you for this day we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for those that have improved over the last week, for Pia and for Claudio and for Jim and the family, as well as um, for the um, improvement of others with COVID, especially the Van Seth family. We thank you that you have brought them up and through this disease and into recovery. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, your Im look uh, is improving for Lori as she's anticipating her vaccination on Wednesday. But we also realize that uh, there are some in the place where she works that are 
experiencing decline and uh, possible um, transition to a new life at the Whitcomb House. We pray for the uh, Marsha's sister's friend, uh, the family, uh, as she has already passed on to be with you. Uh, we pray for Janelle, who is facing the loss of a kidney. And we praise God for the friend in Florida who's been confined for 11 months and has finally received her shots and some uh, good news and was ap actually able to get out of the house and to have something to eat outside the home. And we thank you, Lord, for all of those that are still on our list that indeed need, need our prayers. And we think especially this morning of um, Phil and Betty Twitchell, Tom McGovern's cousin, that uh, you would be with them as they face their um, various trials. He in the nursing home and she in visiting him there. And we thank you for uh, being with those who are still in grief after losing loved ones, either for to Corona or to other things. And we especially lift up to Linda Begevna, our friend and neighbor, who is still, as far as we know, um, being cared for in the hospital for COVID and other related illnesses. And we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for your great care for us. We thank you for all the ways that you show that love and care. Especially we, we praise you for the way that you sent your son and that he lived among us and indeed died for us on the cross and was raised again from death so that we might have freedom. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for the prayer that he taught us to pray as we say together, our Father, Father who art in heaven, in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the, power, and the and glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. 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 So I'm going to mute everyone uh, at this point. So Cheryl, you'll have to unmute to okay. read the prayer. So let us uh, uh, read the scripture rather, the gospel. So let us hear Mark 1, verses 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them and he left their, left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. May we hear in these words, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
And now as we approach our Old Testament scripture, I'll just uh, share uh, some notes on that. Jonah is one of those 12 minor prophets, as we call them, which follow the longer writings of the prophets from Isaiah to Daniel in our Bibles. The Hebrew writers grouped all 12 into one work that they called the Book of the Twelve Prophets. Jonah takes a little different view of a prophet in that he is portrayed as disobedient to the call of God at first, but reluctantly obeys after a storm on the sea endangered him and the crew of the boat he took to flee from the place where he was to prophesy. He was being sent to Nineveh, a city of the Assyrian Empire, an enemy of Israel. Jonah didn't think it was right to give enemies of Israel a chance at redemption, but God had a different opinion. The book of Jonah is a taste of the expansiveness of God and God's view of the world and his desire to give uh, all the chance at salvation. The verses we read today show the results of a people repenting and enjoying the blessings of the Lord through that turning away from their evil ways. Now, Brian, if you would read for us Jonah 3, 1 through 5 and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Wow. A God who changes his mind. That's Master, a did you concept. want to have the second hymn in here? Sure. We can do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Jeff, for the reminder. Sometimes I'm not very good at following the program. But now we come to our sermon, which is entitled, And the People Believed God, based on this reading from Jonah. So the people of Nineveh did not believe in the God of Israel. Nineveh was a city of the Assyrians who had taken Israel captive in one of those times 
when God had seen fit to punish Israel for its apostasy, or to put it another way, for its turning away from God. In this way, the Assyrians were now exposed to the worship of Israel, for even in their captivity, the nation of Israel could not escape God. Though their temple was no longer the place where they practiced their faith, the faithful did find comfort in their God, even in the midst of their captivity, and probably because of it. And though it was most likely frowned upon by their captors, it nevertheless took place in their midst. And though the people of Nineveh were not converted by this practice of the religion of their captives, they were exposed to it. There is no mention in the story about Israel being captive in the city because the final editing of the story came in the fifth to the fourth century BC, a time in which Israel had returned to Jerusalem. And the religious practice of the people of Israel had no effect, <coughs> excuse me. The religious practice of the people of Israel had no effect on the practice of the faith in Nineveh, whatever gods they worshiped. And let's just say that the God of Israel desired that all people would worship him. And he was not enamored of the way the people of Nineveh worshiped. They were dismissive of God and God desired that all people would worship him and him only. And that was the message that Jonah was given to bring to them. Their behavior had angered the God of Israel and Jonah had a message for the uh, inhabitants of Nineveh. 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown, proclaimed the prophet unless they turn from their evil ways. And much to the surprise of Jonah, and much to his chagrin, the people of Nineveh listened. The king of the city joined all the people and even the animals in a fast of repentance. And uh, they turned from their evil ways and God had mercy upon them and forgave them and relented of his threat to wipe out the city, a city that consisted of 120,000 people. And the people of Nineveh enjoyed living in the mercy of the Lord for a season at least, as long as they continued to worship God. But that did not sit well with Jonah. Jonah wanted to, uh, God to go through with his punishment. How could God actually forgive the enemies of Israel? Jonah thought that God was the exclusive God of Israel and that God was not available to those outside of the land of Israel. And he was mad at God for being so forgiving of these others who had been so far from God in their practice. And Jonah wanted to shrink from the mercy God had shown them and bring the catastrophe upon himself. Jonah was mad at God for being merciful. Can you imagine? How could you do this, he said to God, for this people so much unlike Israel? Why not just kill me now? I've not been a good Israelite in bringing a message to the people of Israel, to the people of the enemies of Israel, to which they listened, and on whom God had shown mercy. It was too much to bear for Jonah. Let me just die now, was his plea to God. But just what does that tell us about God? 
Is God's love confined to those who know him already? Are we Christians who have embraced the God of Israel, the only ones God cares about and shows love toward? In a word, no. These people of Nineveh in this story of Jonah were about as far from Israel spiritually as any nation outside of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. They were among the vast people that Israel called Gentiles. And the Gentiles were not available to the God of Israel and the God of Israel was not available to them because they were not of Israel whom God loved. The Gentiles would be considered enemies of the state, enemies of the church of God headed in Israel. We today would be considered among the Gentiles for that was a broad category that meant anyone not of the Hebrew people. Anyone who was not a Jew was a Gentile. And God could not love a Gentile, could he? It just could not be. But this story in Jonah contradicts that thought. God opens his heart to all who will come to him in repentance. For that was the message that Jonah brought to the people of Nineveh. And when you look at the verses that we didn't read between verses 5 and 10, we can see that. Let's hear what happened to the people of Nineveh when they heard the word of the God, the word of the Lord through Jonah, starting in verse 6. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal or herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth. And they shall cry mightily to God and shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his first fierce anger so that we do not perish. Now the putting on of sackcloth was a symbol of repentance in ancient Middle East. It is seen many times in people regretting what they have done and agreeing with God not to do it again. Sackcloth was a coarse cloth that was uncomfortable on the skin. It was like burlap, which would be quite irritating to the skin when put on in place of the, your comfortable clothes, as the king of Nineveh did when he removed his robes and replace them with the sackcloth. As long as it was worn, it would be a reminder to the wearer that God was not pleased with your behavior, just as your skin was not pleased with the cloth. Ashes were a reminder of your origin and your relationship with the God who created you from nothing. The combination of sackcloth and ashes would allow you to think about God as the greater of the two in the relationship between you and God. It was a way to say to God that you who have sinned were to blame and that God who is merciful would prevail in any contest with you or against you. It's like that old grace before meals saying God is great, God is good. God is the greater in the relationship. God is the provider of the meal in terms of the grace. 
God is always good and always merciful when we can acknowledge the greatness and wisdom of God. Sackcloth and ashes symbolize that kind of submissive thinking toward the creator. In addition to the dawning of the sackcloth and the sitting in ashes, the people and even the animals were forbidden to eat or drink. There was a great fast in Nineveh, another way to acknowledge that God was great. The fast removes that thing that sustains the body, the food and the water that the body needs to function. Taking away those things that normally keep the body going and focusing all your attention toward the God who made the body in the first place is another way of recognizing the supremacy of God. Without the nourishment and the life-giving water being put into the body, thoughts must turn to God who provides those things in the first place. The king of Nineveh realized that just maybe the God of the Israelites could have the power to carry out the threat to destroy the city. And if there was any doubt in the beginning, the fast and sackcloth and ashes would reveal the truth. And indeed it did, for the people believed God. And though through their undivided attention paid to God, God revealed himself to them. And in that revelation, they found their own ways to be in error and turned their lives around. They repented of their sin and God did relent of the calamity that he had planned for them. Nineveh was out of danger because they turned to God. They believed that God had the power and the resolve to do what he said he would. And they also believed that God was merciful and would grant them relief if they turned away from their evil. Is that not a message for us today? Can we truly believe that God loves us so much that he will forgive our trespasses and sins and bless us as we turn to him? Oh, yes, it is. Jesus demonstrated God's love for us on the cross, where he died for us. Even before we knew we needed it, God sent his son to be the expiation for our sin, the sacrifice that would end all other sacrifices. Oh, what a mighty God we have. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. The Ninevites came to know God, and God showed them mercy. God's mercy is not confined to the people of Israel, but extends to all the world who would come to him in faith. Amen? Isn't that actually the message that God gave to Abram? when he first called him to leave his home and go to the land that I will show you, the first verse of the 12th chapter of Genesis. The promise was not just for Abraham, but for his descendants, and I will bless those who bless you, says Genesis, and you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 12.3, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And the thought was conveyed also in Isaiah 42.6, where he says, I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations. And Isaiah 49.6, he says, I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So how did the nation of Israel take on a covering of privilege? How did they come to think of themselves as the exclusive receivers of God's blessings, when clearly God had greater things in mind? 
From the beginning, God has been calling all the world to mercy through the people of Israel. They were to be the people who knew God in all his mercy and grace, and were to be the teachers of all others in the world. The people who would move the rest of the world toward God. He never meant the relationship with Israel to be exclusive of all others in the world. And God proved his plan when he sent Jesus to reveal it perfectly. As Paul told his followers in Rome in the third chapter, starting in verse 21. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. God had a plan that was set up through the law and the prophets a term used to refer to Jesus as revealed in the Old Testament. The proof of Jesus coming and the redemption of all people was revealed through the moral and legal terms of the people of Israel and through the prophets who pointed to him through time. All people are equal in God's eyes since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile here. Jesus has become the leveler of the playing field, the one who is the only means of salvation for all the world. That was God's plan from the beginning. The one who believes God will be saved. If you doubt it, just look to the people of Nineveh who sought God and became the beneficiaries of his mercy. Do you believe? Remember Nineveh. Amen. Let us turn now in song to Jeff and trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for oh, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey Amen. Now, will you lead us in our congregational prayer for renewal, Joanne? O oh God, whose power lives in each believer, let us know that power in us. Guide us, Lord, to do great things for you. Let us feel your strength in us, 
renewed every day by your endless and eternal love. Touch us with the wind from God, so we may know it in our heart of hearts. Assure us, Lord, bless us with your presence, your power, and your glory, as we pray in that prayer Jesus taught us. Let us not live in fear, but give us power to serve with, with love all those in need around us. In Jesus' name we pray, the same Jesus who sent your spirit to live in us. Amen. Amen. And now may the God of glory and light, the Savior who came and walked among us, and the Spirit whom he sent to be with us and in us, be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara. Getting to work out with your fingers this morning. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop the recording, but we can continue to fellowship if you'd like.